Hello all, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending when and where you're watching this episode. Welcome to the Goddess Project Podcast. My name is Dr. Carla Ionescu and I am an ancient historian. And today we're going to talk about uh, the goddess Aletheia. Uh, before we jump into the worship of Aletheia, um, I just like to give you a few updates. I know you've been waiting for this episode for a little while. I'm doing this part one of three. So I'm going to do, <clears throat> excuse my voice, I still have a bit of a cough, so my voice might sound a little weird. Um, we're going to do Aletheia, which is today, and then we're going to do Dictina, which is coming up in a couple of weeks, and then we're going to do Brito Martis, which is the last one. And I like to call them the Holy Trinity of the Goddesses of Crete. There are many, many other goddesses of Crete, though, I just want to clarify that. But I've picked these three because they're related to Artemis and because Artemis eventually ends up absorbing, adapting, evolving these divinities into her own worship. And so I thought this would be fun to talk about. Also today, um, if you're watching me on YouTube, I'm going to add to this video uh, some of my own footage that I took yesterday at the Cave of Aletheia in Crete, which um, was really, really exciting and interesting. And I don't know, it was... Um, What's the word? It's not moving. Uh, it was a bit surreal. So as some of you know, I go to a lot of caves. I love caves, particularly caves of the goddess. What was really fascinating to me about this cave that perhaps I wasn't quite ready for, I've, I've seen pictures of it and things like that, was that you have to, so it, it the area looks flat. And if you're watching me on YouTube, you're going to see that video. If not, always feel free to always check out uh, the videos or my or all my social media Artemis expert and so you could see it but um, the cave itself like if you're walking around it just it looks flat right it looks like you're just walking on a flat surface and then there is this hole in the ground with a tree with a fig tree and you go down you have to go down into the hole and then sort of move forward almost like a birth canal into the cave. And then the cave itself <clears throat> is very low. Um, and there was talk about closing it because, um, it, it, you know, people could get injured and they're unclear if it will come crumbling down. I, I really don't think so. It's been there for thousands of years, but whatever. I mean, one hard earthquake and there it goes. Um, but I wasn't expecting it to feel like I was crawling into the womb. Um, I wasn't expecting it to be so dark and so deep in a sense. Um, it, it was quite fascinating. So if you're watching me on YouTube, I'm going to add some of that video to this episode. And if you're listening to me on uh, any other any other app, feel free to check out the videos anytime, anytime. Um, or check out the YouTube anytime. It, it was really exciting and I really wanted to add that and I'd really like to add so the for upcoming Dictina for our upcoming Dictina episode I would really like to add footage from uh, that site and I would have loved to add foot, footage for Brito Martis but there is no specific Brito Martis space but I will keep looking and, and see what comes up yeah I just wanted to add a little bit of footage um, and make the podcast episodes just a little more interactive um so I hope that you enjoy that. Uh, for those of you that are new, welcome, welcome. Um, I hope that you know that I do not edit these episodes. So sometimes I pause and sometimes I draw a bit of a blank as I'm reading stuff and, and going through my research and um, thinking about some of the stuff that I've researched. Um, I really, a very honest conversation style a very honest conversation style um, episode and podcast. And I don't want to, yeah, I don't want it to feel like it's too um, organized. Also, I really like the idea that when I meet people in person, which I often meet a lot of you in person, I want you to feel like, oh yeah, this is the, this is the Carla I've listened to and been talking to. Um <laughs> One of my great fears is to meet people and they go, oh, you're not like you are anywhere on social media. Um, 
And by that, I don't mean like I meet people like a celebrity, <laughs> not even close. What I mean is that there are a lot of people that are interested in Artemis, or there are a lot of people that are in Crete or in Europe or wherever I travel in the States. And I will go to gatherings of women and many of you are listening now. And I just want, when you meet me, other than the hair and the little pigtail horns, which I just like because it's cute and I don't normally wear this outside. Um, I want you to feel like, yeah, okay, I know who she is. Or at least it seems familiar. Yeah. So what else? I think that's about all of the news that I've got. Um, I'm on a little bit of cold medicine, so you may have to pardon me if um, I seem a little more spacey than, than usual. Yeah. So without further ado, let us, let me share my screen with you guys um, and my slides as I do try to be as organized as possible before I begin the podcast. And so I have slides with notes. I used to tell my students all the time um, that the notes on the slides are for me to remember what to talk about, because as you know, I will sometimes just go off on a tangent and um, my students will be like, okay, Carla, let's get back to the main topic. Yeah. Um, and so I like to have slides, but also because I am a visual learner, I like to have other images. There we go. Um, I'd like to have other images of, okay, there we go, of um, the goddess Aletheia. I like um, statues. I like pieces of art. Um, I like visual understandings. And for example, because we're talking about Aletheia today, excuse me, there isn't very much visual representation of Aletheia, which is why it was so important for me to do the cave, because I felt like that might be some visual representation of her. Uh, we really see um, some representation, as you'll see in Greek pottery, but we don't have too much um, in Minoan or Cretan his history uh, artifacts. And um, even within the Greeks themselves, we have only a few pieces. So. I thought I'd share some of the visuals with you and hopefully you find them as helpful and as interesting as, as I did. Yeah. So let's talk about Aletheia. Again, another goddess that I find is highly underrated. So the more I learned about her, I of course I came into connection with her and many, many, maybe many of you do when you when you talk about a labor goddess or <clears throat> a goddess of childbirth, um, a goddess in charge of children, um, especially divine children, but all children. And so because I study Artemis, of course I came across Aletheia. However, I didn't really pay very much attention to her. I always thought of her as a bit of a, of a side goddess. The other obstacle, of course, that comes up a lot, again, is that there are no real artifacts of Aletheia. And so unfortunately, it almost feels like she wasn't that important. And I hope that the episode today will convince you that actually she was quite, quite important. So let's talk about who she is. Okay, so she is known as the goddess of childbirth and labor pains. So I find this, sometimes we say things and then we kind of go by, you know, leave them behind. But when I think about labor pains, I mean, having been in labor twice to have my children, I thought to myself, what a weird thing to say, you know? So goddess of childbirth, okay. Goddess of children, okay. Goddess of birthing, like there's all that, all those words that mean the same thing. And then I thought labor pains and I thought to myself, well, actually labor pains are quite, they're, you know, the most painful thing I've ever felt in my life. And how can a goddess be a goddess of so much pain? And so I started, I think, being a little slower in reading some of the research about her. Okay, so there, there is some debate according to research that there is one Aletheia or two Aletheiae, okay? Um, and so one is facilitate, facilitating birth while the other may prolong labor. So what, what a fast, so already I just started and I thought to myself, what? Um, what a fascinating concept to think about a divinity that you call on to help with labor and childbirthing, and then 
also there may be another one that prolongs your labor and prolongs your pain. So I don't know. I don't know if you see that kind of, it, it feels a bit unique, you know? Um, and so her name then is, means she who comes to aid or she who relieves, in this case, relieving pain or relieving the body of the birth, um, healing, letting go, releasing, etc. She also has a Roman counterpart. So in Roman mythology, she was equated to Lucina, which is light bringer, or Natio, which is the uh, birth, but light bringer. And so this brings me back to her cave here in Crete, because join me for this thought experiment, because coming through the birth canal, coming out through the birth canal in theory, because none of us remember our birth, at least not many of us, you're coming, you're walking towards the light, right? You're walking, you're not walking. <laughs> you're being pushed towards the light and the light is coming, okay? So it's fascinating to me that the Romans decided to call her light bringer. There's something about um, a revelation. It feels like a revelation. It feels like an opening. It feels like all of those things that are, of course, associated with birth. Um, she is often depicted with a torch. So, you know, there's a lot of torches in the ancient world that we have not talked about. There's a lot of, of torch-carrying goddesses. And obviously, the first thing that comes to mind when you think about torch-carrying and light-bringing has to do with knowledge and with learning and with wisdom or light in the darkness, that kind of stuff. And Aletheia also carries a torch. Now, people do say that she carries a torch because women used to give birth in the night a lot. And so midwives used to walk around with torches from house to house. What a fascinating concept. I mean, if you think about that in this sort of symbolic way, that midnight, midwives and the goddess Aletheia carry torches, carry light, bring help, bring healing, bring life into the world and light into the, I mean, there's so much in that, that I find fascinating that I thought to myself, yeah, this, this, this is a goddess that needs to be discussed. And as many of you know, of course, Artemis is my boo and she is the goddess of childbirth. And she also carries a torch and she is often called light bringer. But Aletheia is fascinating to me because she is, certainly in Crete, a goddess that is already here before Artemis arrives. And many people, many academics will say that Artemis sort of adopts, adapts or adopts Aletheia into her um, collection of aspects. And so the reason why I find that a bit fascinating is that Aletheia is sort of an original certainly Cretan divinity that is very much connected to enlightening and relieving pain and bringing light. Yeah. You might all be going, I, I don't get it. Why is that important? But I don't know. I, I'm finding it really fascinating that this concept was there before Artemis arrived and that Artemis adapted this concept. And we can spend hours talking about how come, how, why Artemis adapted this concept and how the Mycenaeans and later on the Greeks adapted all these other native goddesses into their pantheon and all that kind of stuff. But it bears weight that Aletheia is one of the original torchbearers and uh, the reliever of labor pains. So she's also collect, uh, she's also associated, sorry, with um, Hera um, and sometimes Hera, Aletheia are, are also um, overlapping. There is in the Egyptian religion, for example, a Taueret, or Taurt, or Taut, or ta Tuart. Um, and these are different uh, goddess of childbirth and fertility divinities. Um, in Egyptian, the name Taueret also means she who is great or a great one. Um, this, in fact, in Egypt, actually, this goddess is attached or represented by a hippopotamus and is often seen as bipedal. Yeah. Like what I mean is a, a hippopotamus that stands on two feet. So there are these fascinating earlier visions or earlier aspects of Aletheia 
that can be traced perhaps to the Egyptians or can be paralleled to uh, the Egyptians and many other cultures that have goddesses of childbirth. There's also an association actually with aletheia and water, running water, water, um, mistresses of water, she who removes water, that kind of stuff. And of course that has a lot to do with um, birthing being a very um, uh, liquidy, not the right word, a very liquidy um, experience. And the, the breaking of the water before the child comes, the running of the water, all that kind of stuff, lots, lots of that visual comes along. But there's also, like I said, release or relief with that. Is she a pre-Hellenic goddess? Yes. So Aletheia may have been born before the gods. And at least according to Pausanias, for example, Pausanias says that in Arcadia, the most celebrated sanctuary of the Claytorians are those of Demeter, Asclepius, and thirdly, Aletheia. The Lycian Olin, an earlier poet who composed for the Delians, among other hymns, one to Aletheia, styles her as the clever spinner, clearly identifying her with fate and makes her older than Kronos. So that's Pausanias' understanding. Um, I really love this connection between Aletheia and fate and the spinning, you know, so how the, the three fates, for example, have the spin the, uh, the thread of your life and make these decisions or cut the thread of your life. And it seems like Aletheia was a goddess that predates the Olympians and predates even um, Kronos and predates almost all of, let's say, Gaia's progeny. Yeah. So an ancient primordial goddess. Herodotus um, says something in his histories. He says the Dalians relate that two virgins, Argy and Opus, came from the Hyperboreans by the way of the aforesaid peoples of Delos, earlier than Hyperaki and Laodike. These later came to bring Aletheia the tribute which they had agreed to pay for easing childbirth. So Herodotus mentions that Aletheia is one of the early divinities to be worshipped, again, for childbirth. So one of the things that's really fascinating about Aletheia is that she is a very specific goddess. But she makes this one thing her whole thing. And childbirth. And she becomes it. She is the single source of relief and of help in childbirth, at least until she later on becomes attached with Artemis. Okay, so what does that mean as far as where she originates from? Well, in Homer's Odyssey, we are, it is mentioned that Aletheia is the daughter of Zeus and Hera. So she is an Olympian in a sense, as well as the sister of Ares and Hephaestus and Hebe. Yeah. So the Greeks adopt her and make her the child of um, Zeus and Hera. Pausanias says that she also has two children, which we're going to talk about, Sasipolis and Eros. So remember that Eros is often associated with Aphrodite, but here we have an example in which Eros is associated with being or, or is claimed to be the son of Aletheia. How, of course, there's more actually to that story. <laughs> For example, her name derives from the, from the verb elephin, which means the coming or the helping of a goddess or the coming or the helping of goddess. And then in ancient Greek, uh, the words like ele ele means come, come, right? So this idea of um, hurrying, of pushing, of um, bearing down, of rushing. And it's unclear. Some scholars say that um, this name was inherited because 
midwives were often called, like I said, in the middle of the night. And so they were told to like, let's go, let's go, let's go. The, you know, the, the mother is birthing or that midwives as a woman's giving birth are often saying, you know, push, 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 etc. So there is this tradition that her name comes out of the pain, uh, the painful cries of women in birth, in childbirth. And so whether it's, uh, you know, come, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, or whether it's push, 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 either way, there is this sense of immediacy in her name that connects to the rush of pain, the rush of pain. I was just gonna say the rush of birthing, but it's particularly the rush of pain. And so the etymology of her name comes from literally the, the process of birthing. So what about some of her cults and mysteries? There's a ton of cults and mysteries to Eilithia, many of them who I don't think people often talk about. But I thought that would I would read to you some of the primary source that is available to us because there's some really interesting stories around um, what people believed about Eilithia. And, and so, okay, I'm going to read to you some of the primary source. Can you tell me how this goddess has never made it into so much of popular culture? In fact, I can't think of one film or one show. I'm trying to think if there was anything in Percy Jackson, but I don't think so, where Eilithia plays a key role. And yet here she is playing a key role at the very nascent of human creation or, well, maybe not human creation, but human arrival on this planet. I don't know if that makes any sense. I'm going to blame the cold medicine for that. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? We get here, we come out of our mother's wombs. It is the, it is the solitary thing other than death that all humans share. And here is this goddess that is central to that particular moment in time and the pain that it gets to get, it, it takes to get here. And so I think she's especially important. And I think the ancients knew that she was especially important. And yet much like everything else that we've done recently, we have dismissed this goddess from even acknowledgement. So let me read you what Pausanias says about Eilithia in the town of Attica. He says, um, near the Prytoneion in the Hall of Athens is a temple of Eilithia, who they say came from the Hyperboreans to Delos and helped Leto in her labor. Leto is the mother of Artemis and Apollo, as many of you know. And from Delos, the name spread to other peoples. The Delian sacrificed to Eilithia and sing a hymn of Olin. But the Cretans supposed that Eilithia, Eilithia was born at Amnisos in the Cnosian territory in Crete, and that Hera was her mother. Only among the Athenians are the wooden figures of Eilithia draped to the feet. The women told me that two are Cretan, being offerings of Phaedra, daughter of the mythical King Minos of Crete, and that the third is the oldest, Eris, Eriskathon, an early king of Athens, brought to Delos. So in Athens, we have these statues to Eilithia, two brought over from Crete and one from Delos. And the Cretans actually give her a birthplace in Crete and say that she's the daughter of Hera. Again, you could do a whole show about this, an entire movie that would be really interesting. Okay, what about in Argos? Pausanias says, um, near the Lord's sanctuary in Argos is a sanctuary of Eilithia, dedicated by Hel Helen, or Helene, when Theseus, having gone away with uh, Periathosis to Thesprosia, Thesprosia, Aphdina had been captured by the this Kuroi and Helen was being brought to Lacedaemon. Okay, that's a lot of Greek names for Greek places. Basically, there is a sanctuary to Eilithia at um, Argos dedicated by Helen when Theseus tried to kidnap her. Okay. Um, but in, according to Pausanias, he says, Helen, for it is said that Helen was with child that was delivered at Argos and founded the sanctuary of Eilithia, giving the daughter she bore to Clytemnestra, who was already wedded to Agamemnon. So 
there's this fascinating connection between Helen and Klein and Mestra, and of course, Agamemnon, Theseus, and all the others, and the goddess Aletheia, and establishing a, um, a temple to Aletheia at Argos. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. In Mycenae, for example, there is another sanctuary to Aletheia. Pausanias tells us all about it. Um, and she shares an altar there with Helios, which is the sun god. Uh, there's a sanctuary at Elis, for example. Actually, the sanctuary at Elis sounds kind of interesting. Um, Pausanias says that, and so for those of you who may not know who Pausanias is, I should say that Pausanias is, is an ancient travel blogger. And he is the, the only source that we have that is quite this extensive, in which he just went from town to town and collected local stories. I mean, he was really living the dream at the time. And so all of these stories that I'm telling you are part of is where he stopped at temples of Aletheia and asked people, what is the story of this temple? How did it come to be built? Who, who organized it? Who dedicated it? Who paid for it, basically? So he arrives in, Pausanias arrives at the foot of Mount Kronios in Olympia. And he says, on the north between the treasuries and the mountain is a sanctuary of Aletheia. And in it, Sosipolis. Sosipolis is her daughter, her, her son, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And he, Sosipolis means the savior of the city or the savior of the state. So interesting that in this town, Aletheia, the goddess of childbirth, has a child herself. And this child is a savior, savior of the city, savior of the state. Now this, now this surname, Aletheia Olympian, and cho chose a protein chose a priestess for the goddess every year. So at her temple, a young woman was a priestess and took on the name of Aletheia, or perhaps in some cases, um, an old woman. So in this case, Pausanias says, there is an old woman who was a priestess who tends Sosipolis herself too by an Aelian custom. And she lives in chastity, bringing water for the God's bath and setting before him barley cakes kneaded with honey. So there is an older priestess that takes care of the temple, including um, the space for Sassipolis. In the front part of the temple is an altar of Elithia and an entrance for the public. In the inner part, Sassipolis is worshipped and no one may enter it except the woman who tends the God and she must wrap her head and face in a white veil. Maidens and matrons wait in the sanctuary of Aletheia, chanting a hymn. They burn all manner of incense to the god, but it is not the custom to pour libations of wa or wine. An oath is taken by Sosipolis on the most important occasions. The story that when the Arcadians had invaded the land of Elis and the Elians were set in array against them, a woman came to the Elian generals holding a baby to her breast who said that she was the mother of the child that she gave him because of dreams to fight for the aliens. The alien officers believed that the woman was to be trusted and placed the child before the army naked. When the Arcadians came on, the child turned at once into a dracon or a dragon. Thrown into disorder at the sight, the Arcadians turned and fled and were attacked by the aliens, who won a very famous victory and so called the god Sosipolis. On the spot where after the battle the where after the battle the snake seemed to them to go into the ground, they made the sanctuary. With him the Elaeans revolved to worship Aletheia also, because this goddess this goddess helped them brought her son forth onto men. So as you can see, one of the cults <laughs> is pretty much the Christian story of Mary and Jesus. Aletheia has Sosipolis. Sosipolis is the savior of the city. There is this sort of mythology that at the time of battle, this woman walked up and offered her child at the front of uh, the, the generals at the front of the battle, um, which is kind of interesting because, of course, no one would do that. But anyway, she puts the child down on the floor. The general goes, yeah, this seems like a good idea. And the child turns into a dragon or a large snake. Dracon and snake are sort of the same word. And helps defeat, you know, the, the um, Arcadians are so terrified by this dragon that they run away. And then when that dragon sort of settles down and disappears into the land, they built this sanctuary um, to Aletheia and Sosipolis. So 
there is this much more powerful history to Aletheia. I mean, not only does she have a son who is a savior, but may also be a dragon that I think we very often, or certainly I can speak for myself because I often totally overlooked her and thought, oh, well, you know, she's just an early version of Artemis. But no, Aletheia has a child. Artemis does not have children, but Aletheia has a son. And if we think about Eros, like I mentioned earlier, she may have two sons. Now, there are numerous other cults and mysteries that's, that are sort of repetitive, and I've made you a list here, um, but you can find these easily. There are, you know, they're all over Tegia, Claytor, Aegean, Aegean, in Ikea, in Attica, everywhere, there are numerous temples to Eletheia. Now, I'd, I wouldn't say that there are as many as a traditionally Olympic god or goddess, but enough that, again, it feels like perhaps this is a divinity that we need to talk about. And because Eletheia is such a powerful mother midwife figure, it doesn't surprise us at all that she is midwife to the gods. And so I thought I'd talk about um, three of the famous births which Eletheia attends. And these are the ones that are often depicted on vases or on pottery, of course, because they're the births of God, gods. But um, these are the only few ones that we have a representation of Eletheia. Um, and so we get to see her, let's say, see her in the public eye of the Greeks based on these uh, births. Let's start with my favorite, the birth of Artemis and Apollo. Um, so Leto, who was, of course, said to be the mistress of Zeus, of Zeus um, was looking for a place to give birth. And many of you know that this is because we're told that Hera was jealous, you know, the jealous nagging wife and was uh, looking to make Leto's pregnancy and birth quite difficult. So some stories say that Leto actually asked Python, who was a monster in the shape of a large snake, to chase Leto all over the known world and prevent her from finding a safe place to deliver babies. There's lots of theory, there's lots of stories and mythologies around this, depending on where you're listening to some of these stories. Uh, the most popular one is, of course, that uh, Leto is trying to give birth without Hera noticing, but no one is letting her find the place to give birth. That's the most popular one. This one, though, is an interesting one. So that Hera already knew Leto was about to give birth. So she releases Python and makes Python chase her everywhere. And so then Leto, of course, travels from Athens to Aegina to Theva to everywhere. Couldn't find a place to give birth safely. After all of that, but Leto was really distressed. And it is at this moment that we're told that Eletheia disobeys her mother Hera and decides to assist Leto. So holding a pine tree, Leto manages to deliver the twins, Apollo and Artemis, on the island of Delos after nine days of traveling around Greece. And so we're told that Aletheia shows up to the birth and helps Leto give birth to Artemis and Apollo. But you see, as some of you might be thinking, now wait, I thought that Artemis is born and helps. Yes. So what happens is, is the earlier version in which Aletheia, quite rightfully so, the goddess of childbirth, helps Leto give birth to the twins, gets amalgamated when Artemis begins to take over the responsibility of childbirth, with Artemis being born first, I guess, fully formed. What was that a question about that? Um, and then helps her mother give birth to Apollo. So and, and, you know, when I think about it now, I mean, that is such a drastic change. And what I mean is in our in our modern world, because everything's written down and everything is, you know, there's a lot of receipts and there's all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's very difficult to move a story from, uh, yeah, there was an extra goddess that showed up and helped with the birth to somehow the firstborn, which is Artemis, is born fully grown and helps with the birth. Like, that seems like a very drastic change. But over time, because Artemis becomes associated with Aletheia in such a simultaneous way in everyone's minds, 
they don't, you know, they don't really even think about it. They just tell the stories and people, uh, people assume or people understand that when they say Artemis helped or Aletheia helped, it's the same divinity. I know when you think about it, it doesn't actually make sense, but trying to understand the way that ancient people thought they weren't as particular about um, the details or the, the you know, the, the evidence or such a thing. And so they went, oh yeah, Aletheia, Artemis, perfect, all good things, you know? Um, Perfect. So that's the birth of Artemis and Apollo. Another interesting story is Aletheia's contribution to the birth of Heracles, or in this case, delaying the birth of Heracles. So according to a couple of the primary sources, um, when Zeus and Alcamene, Alcmena, sorry, became, when Zeus got Alcmena pregnant, who was the mother of Heracles, um, he promised that from the family of Perseus, which is the grandfather of Alcmene, an offspring would be born and that his fate would be to become the king of Argos. But Hera, according to some of the, these ancient sources, Hera was jealous, of course, as always, and persuaded Zeus to say that the firstborn offspring of the line of Perseus, um, it would be the king of Argos. And so what happens is Hera persuades Aletheia to prolong Alcmena's birth, who is pregnant with Heracles, and then shorten the birth of his cousin, um, Eurystheus, um, so that Eurystheus is born first. And so then what happens is that Eurystheus becomes the king of Arcos, and he is the one to challenge Heracles on performing all 12 of his labors. So in a sense, Hera plays, I was going to say plays God. Uh, Hera plays a key role in using Aletheia to prolong or shorten the birth, labor, pain, etc., and manipulates the birthing time so that Eurystheus is born first and Heracles become, is second and then Heracles is constantly trying to catch up, you know? Um, but Aletheia then has this power to hold back birthing um, or help ease birthing. So this becomes very important as we'll look at the importance of things like rope, wreaths, and garlands when it comes to Aletheia, that there is something... Mm, she has the ability to tie the string of childbirth or release, right? Release the girdle of, of pregnancy and release the birth. So there is this um, uh, fascinating control that she has over the birthing of children, especially divine children. The last story is the birth of Athena. And I want to preface this by saying this story is more support, supported by archaeological finds and artifacts than it is by actual primary source. So many of you know that Zeus, of course, impregnates Matisse, who is um, this goddess, the goddess of wisdom and the daughter of um, Oceanid and Tythos. And of course, he's trying to hide this pregnancy from Hera, as usual. You're seeing a pattern here. Um, and he he swallows Matisse, okay? He swallows a, a pregnant woman. And then uh, we're meant to understand that somehow Athena is born in his body and that she is fully formed and with her armor and that she is banging on her armor and giving him a headache. So there's there's lots for me to say about this. In fact, I've never really done an episode on Athena because I think there's just so much to say and it may all be negative, but I may have to add that to the list. So there's lots of symbolism here for Zeus giving birth as a dude through his head because Athena comes out of his head, whatever. But let's leave that to the side for now. What's really fascinating is that we are told that Zeus turns to Prometheus to make him the tools to crack his hut open and let Athena come out. And yet 
There are numerous depictions as the one that you see here on screen, or you can just Google Aletheia and Athena. There are numerous depictions that say that Aletheia was at the birth. And I find that really fascinating because number one, Zeus is a dude. So he's got no labor pains other than a headache. Perhaps the headache is Zeus's male idea of what labor pains feel like, which is kind of laughable. Um, but the the you know the point of that story of Athena is that they were trying the patriarchy, let's say, was trying to erase Athena's maternal line as much as possible, and so therefore Zeus becomes the pregnant being. His head, you know, she's born within his body. She's fully armed like an armored soldier. He turns to his son. He helps him crack his head open, not his belly. Notice, not his belly, but his head. And yet, if we were to believe that very masculine adaptation of a story that's completely illogical, why is Aletheia there? And so she is so often depicted at the birth. So my suggestion is that either the visual depictions of Aletheia at the birth of Athena confirm what everyone, of course, knew, which is that um, you couldn't give birth without a woman present or female divinity present, except however you want to phrase that. Number two, that in order for the birth, and I say that in quotation marks, to be socially accepted, Aletheia, the goddess of childbirth, had to be there, even if the birth was actually Prometheus cracking Zeus's head open. Does that make sense? Again, it's one of those fascinating things that the more you think about, the more you fall down that rabbit hole, right? Because it's like, it makes no, it never makes any sense anyway that Zeus is supposedly giving birth from his head. But that's okay because we've seen, you know, we're, we don't take mythology literally. And yet, and yet, they're a, the, the largest art of the most uh, common artifacts of Aletheia are her being present at Athena's birth. So there's something there, you know, visually there. And again, we have to understand that the ancient history that we know from primary source is elite male history. At this point, by that, I mean that we have not yet found um, primary women's writings that are, you know, of a comparable time or parallel time with Herodotus or Homer or whoever we want to say as the ancient writers. They're all male writers. And so visual art, though, like on pottery and ceramics and other things, um, were also made by men, but also a variety of artists. I mean, we don't know. I think we assume that men did all of the pottery and art and things like that. Again, this is an assumption based on some of the stuff that we found. Um, it's, you know, this is a longer story to dissect, but my point is that there must have been something in society, in the social norms and, and understanding that forced, in a way, Aletheia to be present at the birth of Athena, and that this image was so popular with people, that they enjoyed this image so much, rather than Prometheus cracking his head open and letting him out, letting her out, that we have several artifacts. Um, I'd like to say maybe 10, 12, but perhaps there are more. Um, and this is one of the only depictions of Aletheia that we have found so far in the ancient artifacts. So it's 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 a fascinating side story. I, I don't have the words today, but it, it's, it's a fascinating detail to the story that sometimes, you know, when you're telling a story, you kind of overlook it. And because I was forced to look at it, I thought to myself, well, that's weird that she's there. Why is she there? Prometheus is there. He's already helping. And then I thought, hmm, she must be there for a reason. And the artists must really like that because they keep painting that scene, you know? And so I thought that was quite fascinating. Um, so make of that what you will. Okay, before we move on to 
Alethea's role as a mother herself. I would like to insert in here my visit to the Alethea cave. So if you're on YouTube, continue watching. Um, if you're on anywhere else where you're listening to this podcast, we will move on to the next section and uh, feel free to, again, go watch um, the videos from the cave anytime on any of my social media. If you think about it, since we've come down through there, this really is a descent into the womb of the earth. And this really looks like it's coming up. And you could really imagine ancient peoples descending deeper and deeper, deeper and deeper. into the cave. I have to duck a little bit. Whoa. But let's go in. Just a little bit more in here. Yeah, I think that this is the... I can't really see in here. See if I can turn on my lights. Hold on. You can see the other pieces right there. Hold on, where's my finger? You can also see why sometimes this cave is closed because um, the locals are not sure if it's going to fall on to anybody at any point in time. Okay, so let's. Let's talk about Elithia as the mother to Sassipolis. So we've already talked about the story of him being the city savior um, in Elis and how, um, how he played a key role in them being able to defeat the Arcadians. Some of the things that I thought were really fascinating about Sassipolis and his... So two things. Number one, Elithia is a mother that gives birth right? Technically, uh, literally, and has a son, literally. And this son is a savior, in this case, a savior of a city. It's interesting that in Ellis, his sanctuary, or the shrine that's dedicated to him is the sanctuary of Tike. Tike is also the protector of cities or the goddess of cities. Uh, sometimes when a goddess or a god, but when a goddess wears one of those towers on her head, this is called a Tike or this goddess is also a TK, which is the savior or protector of city, of a city. Many gods were protectors of cities. Uh, I don't know. You can probably hear my neighbor's dog barking in the background. <laughs> Sorry about that if you can't hear him. If not, that's even better. So there's this fascinating link that there's this fascinating difference between Elithea as goddess of childbirth, who gives birth to a son who is a savior of a city, versus when she is adapted into Artemis, who is a goddess of childbirth, who leans heavily on the protection of women and girls and some boys, but has no children. She becomes ever virgin. So I hope that you can see the cracks in the patriarchal arrangement of mythology. What I mean by that is that you can see how Aletheia is a, let's say, if we use Crete, a native regional goddess of childbirth, in this case, who lives in a, in a beautiful cave where women go to give childbirth or go to make offerings or et cetera. She metaphorically is the goddess of birth canals, labor pains, light bringer, but she also technically has experienced the pain of childbirth and all of that. And then over time, she becomes replaced or adapted into Artemis, who is more of a goddess of wilderness, a goddess of the wild, a goddess of animals. 
a goddess of the hunt, all that kind of stuff, who then is given this label, this duty, this association with childbirth and the protection of women, but is not given the additional story of having a child. Now, for me, myself, personally, that's fine. I, you know, In the sense of, I, I don't care that Artemis has no children. I don't think that you need to have children to be the protector of women in childbirth. Don't get me wrong. I just think that that is, I just think that that is so purposely done though. And so then again, for me, I like to look right in between the lines and the cracks, like, why, why? Because for women, certainly Artemis's virginity is irrelevant. Number one, because I think many of us don't think about her virginity like a literal hymen, unbroken hymen. I think we think of her virginity en masse, or most of us, as not married, right? A woman, and in that case, uh, Aletheia is also not married. Um, but in fact, the father of Sosipolis is a bit of a mystery as well. So there's a, and so the second thing, which is what I'm leaning to here, is that it, Aletheia may have been one of the last goddesses after Hera to give birth parthenogenetically. And so there is no talk about Sosipolis's father. So I don't know which one I'm fascinated more about, actually, to be honest. Am I more fascinated by Aletheia, goddess of childbirth, who gives birth to a son um, parthenogenetically, or at least so it is implied because his father's not really mentioned? Um, or am I more fascinated by the fact that Artemis is given this role of childbirth and helping women in childbirth without, not only without having a child, but then told or we're told that she's ever virgin. And then that ever virgin begins to weigh heavier and heavier and heavier on the hymen, less so on the lack of a male companion. Anyways, I'm going on a little bit of a rant here, sorry. But both of those options are fascinating to me. Um, but it makes Eletheia that much more of an interesting and powerful divinity. And again, it makes me feel like it's very important that we talk about her. It's very important that we remember her and it it echoes, it echoes forward into the birth or the story of the birth of Jesus and the Virgin Mary and all that kind of stuff. So it allows us by learning this history, for example, knowing that this history predates Christianity by at least three thousand years. So it predates Christianity longer than Christianity has existed, assuming Christianity's existed for the last fifteen hundred years or eighteen hundred years. Or so, so. It it gives us um, an an origin story, an origin um, example for why people may have been fascinated with these stories and slowly made Mary into a virgin and Jesus the savior. What I mean is like we can see that there is a pattern of mythologies. That is not just Aletheia, lots and lots and lots of stories of um, gods who have mir miraculous births. But this one is an interesting one because it's so, so close to the, um, the word savior for Jesus, the savior of the city, the savior of a people. And the other thing that's fascinating um, is in the story in which um, this woman came to give to offer her child um, at the you know, to the general in this war and place the child on the on the floor. The fact that the child turns into a dragon serpent, it, you know, is equally as fascinating. And then of course defeats the army and then sort of disappears. So, and the other thing that's really fascinating is as I mentioned before, is at the temple of Sosipolis and Aletheia in Elis, only an older woman could be the priestess which is interesting. There's really no explanation for why it could be only an older woman, but it had to be an elderly priestess. And the elderly priestess, like I said, lived a life of chastity, not a virgin, not a virgin, just, you know, she swore off relations once she became a priestess, offered the God water for his bath, barley cake and barley cakes kneaded with honey. So, you know, she cooked and bathed the God. And 
maidens and matrons waited in the Eletheia section for, uh, you know, chanting hymns and offering incense and all of that kind of stuff. So there is so much here in this sort of simple story that is symbolic of women's secret mysteries, you know, and I'm starting to believe this may be a little side rant, sorry, but I'm starting to believe, especially now, you know, if you're on social media and you're seeing the, the 4B movement and the 4G movement or 5B, I, I don't know, I don't know what they're naming things anymore. Um, what I'm seeing that's really fascinating with all of these movements is the control of the creating body. So the life creating body is obviously the women, a woman's body. And this body, I can't find the words. I'm sorry. The cold medicine is too tough today. So you'll have to excuse my weird rants, but the female body, the procreating body, the women's, a woman's body is the battlefield for power. Okay. In the case of the 4B movement today, for example, women are saying, no, we're not having children. We're not doing it. So that is self-control of my of my own body. Okay. In the case of the 5G movement and all those other, whatever they call them, the different names they've given themselves, men who are saying, we refuse to give you children, blah, blah, blah. Um, again, the battle though is over the body that creates life. Okay. Why is that so fascinating? Because it seems, according to the mythology of Aletheia, that the body that creates life and then helps to continue creating life from other bodies in as a midwife goddess has so much power and influence that it can stop wars right so the woman gives her son up sosifolus puts him on the floor whatever it can stop wars it can protect entire cities protect entire civilizations it is the essence of humanity i guess that's kind of what i'm trying to say I, and i think that's where my mind goes when i think about aletheia i think and it actually goes when i think about birthing for those of you who watch my caving videos i think you know i also had a bunch of aha moments while i was doing that because it was we don't talk about how important the birthing body is or how important birthing is or how foundational. I mean, I think we know it, of course, on a scientific level that birthing bodies must exist in order for humanity to continue, blah, blah, blah. But we don't think about how much power there is in that. And of course, this explains why in the States, um, the patriarchal you know, system is trying to have control over women's bodies in birthing and I guess to me it's it's a bit devastating that we continue to have these um, these fights these legal situations these issues in our society probably because we've debased and dismissed the power of the procreating body now I'm going to, you know, move into something super radical feminist, but this idea that women's, because women's body hold the power of procreation, they then have the power to understand life in a different way and then are the rightful leaders or heirs to leadership, they are inheritance of leadership of humanity and society. And I don't know that that's that radical, but I, I guess what I'm trying to get to is that the physical power of procreation leads to the literal power over society. And I think the ancients knew that. And I'm not sure that in the early, early days, let's say in the pre-Greek days, it didn't frighten them in any way, no matter, no matter you know, what gender they were. It didn't frighten them. It was something that they understood quite clearly. And Eletheia is a remnant of that understanding, is a remnant of that society in which birthing was honored and the child of women, like all of us humans, um, were seen as sort of having gone through this um, natural order. And 
celebrated, you know? So there is something that is um, yeah, intrinsically interesting about talking about birthing. I think more than I think about it. This is why I get a little bit lost in it when we talk about it. Because I think when we talk about it on an everyday basis, we go, yeah, yeah. But then when I start to think of it philosophically in this way, you just kind of go on these side rants, yeah? Um, there was a shrine in Ellis dedicated to the Sassifolis near the century of Te Tike, like I said, in Ellis. But in this shrine, the god was depicted as a boy, a boy, wrapped in a star-spangled robe and holding the horn of Amalthea, a scene in a dream. So the horn of cornucopia, the horn of um, prosperity. So when I read that bit about the, the boy was wrapped in a star-spangled robe, like there is so much in symbolism. There is so much that we don't know or we take for granted. And then as you learn specifically ancient history, you see so much of our modern society in ancient history. And you may not be surprised, maybe like, yeah, of course. But the symbolism, the metaphors, the storytelling is purposely designed to use power symbols that we may not understand. Uh, sorry, that's taking us on a whole other rant and it's starting to sound a bit like a conspiracy theory. I'm not sure that it's a conspiracy theory for sure, but I think that people who are educated or powerful, which in the past were all the elites and usually men, understood all of the things that we are now learning um, in the last couple of hundred years and mass and use that symbolism and those metaphors to their own advantage to communicate power, to communicate ideas, to communicate, et cetera. And now as we are beginning to learn about these things, we feel like the veil is being pulled from our eyes, you know, because we have been kept in a way in such darkness about these stories, these practices. And it is my favorite part about ancient history to share with you some of these pieces and to discuss sort of the philosophical implications of that. That's my favorite part. It is also the reason why I do this podcast, but also the reason why I teach ancient history and also the reason why we keep losing funding for the humanities in ancient history, because no one wants us to learn about these stories and these symbols and these metaphors. And so what you have is if you don't fund that, especially today, what you will have is you will have, let's say all these Google learners. And I don't mean that in a negative way because you can look up things on Google. There's nothing wrong with that, but you need a guide. You need a mentor. You need a teacher when, let's say, let's say you start doing research by yourself about some of these things like Alithia and stars and suns and serpents and all that. You really need somebody to facilitate that learning give you a foundation of how to organize that learning and contextualize that learning before you move on and, you know, figure things out for yourself. And so university classes or high school classes or whatever that deal with ancient history, that deal with ancient language, because language is important when we're translating things. If those are all dismissed and all you have is Google, you're at a disadvantage because now you've got 5,000 things coming at you and you don't know how to organize those in a trustworthy way. And so you end up sometimes in these massive conspiracies or massive stories or massive interconnections that then appear ludicrous. And so they, you know, then they dismiss you as a conspiracy theorist. Oh, so it's one of the things I'm having a real, a real problem with lately. Um, yeah, it's this sort of extremism of Google learning without a foundation. Anyways. Okay, my rant is finished about uh, Sassifolis. But I think in the story, there was so much there was enough symbolism and meaning that I think it's a great example for having this conversation. Um, and 
it's not that far removed from um, later on Christianity and other stories. Okay, I will get off my soapbox. Thank you, thank you, thank you for listening. Thank you. Let's talk about the Temple of Zeus, Sasipolis. The Temple of Zeus, Sasipolis wraps up what I'm trying to say very, very easily is that, and, and this is the Temple of Magnesia on the Meander, and it was built around 221 BCE. And um, it was the embodiment of Sasipolis, but through Zeus. And so it's, an in, it's again, an interesting story because it's a small temple, but it is a temple in which Zeus takes over the responsibility as protector of the city. So remember that Sasipolis translates to savior of the city. And here we have a direct example on how Zeus becomes the central figure in this temple. And he takes on the name here um, and Magnesia on the Meander as Zeus Sasipolis. So, and we're told that there was a colossal statue of Zeus um, that was that was enthroned within the temple. It was um, in this area in Magnesia. There was a sanctuary to Artemis. So this is this can be a little bit confusing. So there is an there is a sanctuary to Artemis in um, Magnesia, and the agora in the agora of this temple, in the, in the garden, in the space of this temple, um, there was a small temple, they call it a modest temple or whatever, um, dedicated to Zeus Sasipolis. So here, and then in front of this temple, as you can see in this image, is a statue of Athena. <laughs> so I wonder if this is a, a fantastic example for how amalgamation happens. Artemis, who inherits the responsibility of Eilithia, goddess of childbirth, has a temple in which Zeus becomes Sasipolis. Zeus takes on the name of Eilithia's son, savior of the city. Zeus becomes the savior of the city. And in front of Zeus's temple is a statue of Athena to whom Zeus have give, has given birth from, I say in quotation, from his head. Does that make sense to you? So do you see how in this small space, this, this sanctuary space with the Agora and the temple, we see the overlaying adaptations. Okay. Like it blows my mind. It blows my mind because you don't think, I don't, I don't think about it, you know? So if I went to visit this, um, for example, this piece is in the, uh, um, the Pergamon Museum in Berlin, pieces that have been found at the temple of uh, Susa Sipolis and the statue of Athena. When you see the artifacts, you don't always take in the layers and layers of history and adaptation that take place. But when you start looking stuff up and you start doing some of the research, you go, Look at the multi-layered adaptation that had to happen here. And in your mind, you can almost see the recreation, the removal of Eilithia, ancient goddess who had her own son on her own, parthogenetically, to Artemis, goddess of the well that is now giving, given the responsibility of childbirth. Okay, I'm, I'm with you so far. To Zeus, who I can't stand, but anyways, who takes on the sacredness of this parthogenetic child, Sasipolis, savior, protector of the city, to Athena at the front of the temple, who Zeus tells us, in quotations, that he births supposedly parthenogenetically because people keep forgetting that Athena had an actual mother. It just... It just blows my mind. And I wanted to share this temple with you because I wanted to show you how the scaffolding happens. And over time, as generations are born and generations die, the old stories are forgotten. 
And so then all that modern, and by that I mean ancient Greeks, but more modern Greeks would do if they showed up at the temple of Sassipolis, they would just assume Zeus was Sassipolis and here's Athena, you know, his parthenogenetic child. Like we forget the stories of old. On purpose, we are meant to forget them because the representation is so powerful and takes over much of our learning. So I thought I would share this with you because it's fascinating. Lastly, I wanted to talk about this article that I dug up by Lillian B. Lawler from 1948. Okay, so it's a very dated article, but the archeology span of it is good and the translation of it is good, but I also found it fascinating. Again, one of those small things you dig up where you read it and you're like, this is fascinating stuff. How come I never heard of it again? So it's kind of, you know, left to be. But um, Lillian B. Lawler talks about this piece, this um, small um, couple of sentences in the hymn uh, to the Dillian Apollo. It's a, Homer it's a Homeric hymn. And he talks about Eletheia. So this whole article is about Eletheia. And I have the article in front of me so that I can quote um, Lawler. Because I'm... Because I'm uh, well, I'd like to find all my research from you guys, for you guys. Um, if I find an article that has so much that I want to read, I don't want to take away the credit from the original author. So I thought that I would read to you some of the things that Lawler has dug up or or presents uh, about Aletheia. So he says, um, excuse me, in the hymn to the Delian Apollo, it's the hymn in which um, you know, Leto's giving birth and all of the goddesses have, uh, there's lots of goddesses there that are, that are present, but not Eletheia. Remember that Hera would not let her come. And according to the hymn, the Homeric hymn, after a long wait, one of the lesser goddesses sends Iris to Eletheia, promising her that if she will come to Delos and help Leto, she will be rewarded with a great hormos almost a Greek word, of nine cubits and strung with gold threads. And Eletheia decides to come then and the infant God is born. So two things I want you to think about here. Number one, in this Homeric hymn to, to um, Apollo, the Delian Apollo, it's only the birth of Apollo and Eletheia is helping and she's helping in exchange for this garland. And so I was like, okay, that's weird on so many levels. But Let's see what Lawler is talking about. Um, and so he Lawler analyzes the Homeric hymn. And they talk about how the word hormos is usually translated into necklace. However, a necklace of nine cubits is about a 14 foot long necklace. And so Lawler is like, this doesn't make any sense. How is Eletheia showing up for a necklace that's 14 feet long? And so Lawler dives into this additional research and decides, based on this research, that this may refer to a type of garland or a cord or a rope, which is fascinating because in childbirth, sometimes midwives would use a cord or a rope to tie around the top of the woman's belly and push down so that the baby would come through. Um, and of course, the when you're talking about a cord or a rope, that also is the umbilical cord itself. So I thought to myself, well, that's some interesting things that Lawler is saying in 1948. Um, and then Lawler talks about how Athenaeus, for example, says that the word hormos is used apparently as a synonym for Stephanos, which is a garland. And I don't know about you, but I feel like Aletheia is the primary connection to the whole Christianity story because, and you know, the celebration of um, Christmas, for example, with garlands. So there's what I mean is that there's so many symbols that have been adapted for Christianity from the mythology of Eletheia that you can't help but notice them. Then Lawler says that in the cult of Eletheia in all the Greek lands, wreaths were of great importance, especially those that were made from a magical herb called dittany. So then I was like, okay, what is dittany? And when I looked it up, Dittany is a plant that can that is only found in Crete. And it is a mountainous plant 
that serves either as an aphrodisiac, interesting, or it serves, it has like medicinal purposes. People make tea with it. It's, it's, it's a magic, I say that in quotation, a magic plant that does all the things. Now today, it is rare to find dittany in the wild. Apparently it is, one, it is an endangered um, species. And that is because <laughs> there's the stories, legends of young men who would climb the mountains of Crete to find this plant and give it to their partners as a sign of their devoted love because it was so uh, treacherous to climb the mountains and find this plant and give it to, to their partners. Um, and so, and then because it has medicinal products and all of medicinal um, uses, uh, it became an endangered species. So they do grow it in farms here, but it is very hard to find it in the wild. Um, but I did snap a picture of what it looks like so that if I do see one in the wild, I will definitely take pictures for you. Um, the goddess Eletheia is frequently depicted in art as wearing a wreath of dittany, um, which were placed at the heads of her statues. Wreaths of silver and gold seem to have been particularly appropriate as offerings or votives for her shrines. And wreaths or garlands or ropes are used freely in the inscriptions of Delos at Delos, referring to the cult of Aletheia. And there are lots of them left at her shrine there. So there were, for example, in Delos, there were wreaths or garlands on her throne. There are wreaths and garlands everywhere. But here's an interesting um, small thing that Lawler says. He says, Aletheia is often identified with Artemis, yes. Although the ancient divinity had a shrine of her own at Delos, so although Aletheia, Aletheia has a shrine of her own at Delos, she also has a share in the worship in the Artemision. The Artemision is the one in Ephesus or Turkey. So here I found a really interesting um, side note that Aletheia is worshipped both at Delos, where Artemis is, meant, is said to be born, but also in Turkey, at where Artemis of Ephesus is um, worshipped. So the, the relationship between Artemis and Aletheia is certainly complex. Um, in the fourth century in Turkey, in Ephesus, at the Artemis Zone, it became the custom to list her treasures, Aletheia's treasures, along with Artemis, or even along with Apollos, instead of separately, as it had been earlier the custom. So here you see the overlap. Right. So initially, all their sacred gifts were itemized separately, and then they all became one. Okay. So scholars um, have often depicted the hormones as a wreath, um, as a cable, like um, as a as a interconnected cable, like wreath or garland. However, sometimes it this garland is associated with a snake. And so I thought, wow, a snake, which then if you think about Aletheia's uh, story about her son with the Sasipolis and how that child was left at the front of the army and he became a dracon or a snake. So there's a lot of overlap here. There's a lot of interconnection. Um, there's also this legend that at the temple of Aletheia, seven youths and seven maidens would, would do this dance called the geranos or geranos um, and that the hormones and that the wreath was something that they would carry. So Lawler then goes on to discuss that this dance, if, if I can describe it for you, was sort of like seven youths and seven uh, maidens would coil around holding this interconnected garland and do this really interesting and fascinating dance that looked like a moving snake. And then what's interesting is that Lala goes on to say that in fact, they used to do this dance in ancient Crete for Ariadne because Ariadne is associated with the dance of Geranos in prehistoric times. So again, we return back to, to Crete and um, Eletheia's origins. And in fact, um, Lola goes on to talk about how at the cave of Aletheia, which is the one that you've watched today, pe uh, people used to come and um, do the dance, do this kind of garland 
um, circular dance into the cave so that they didn't just walk into the cave, that they would sing and carry a garland or a wreath and do a specific dance that was sort of interlinked to get into the cave at Eletheia. And so I thought, wow, like that's just, just fascinating. And so the dance looks like an interconnected wreath or garland. It reminds me, I don't know, maybe I'm dating myself, right? But when I was back home in Romania, and I know that uh, people in Canada did it at least, I don't know, many, many years ago, we used to make garlands for the um, Christmas tree by cutting like colorful construction paper into these thin lines, and then you would curl them, right? You'd make like links, you'd tape them, <laughs> then you'd make another one and you'd tape it and you'd make all these links. It looked like a chain link, but it was like a colorful link and you would use that as a garland um, for the tree. And I know that in Canada, I think they were doing it probably wherever you are, they, people did it when they were children as well. And so when I think about the way that this hormos this necklace for Aletheia is basically an interconnection of links. And so there are different scholars that say these might have been gold and silver links. Some people say these were flower links, et cetera, whatever they were, but they were linked. And that youths were dancing, holding these links and moving around. I thought to myself, wow, I wonder how similar uh, these links might be to the Christmas links, uh, the Christmas wreaths or garlands I used to make as a kid. So it was so it was a garland that resembled a snake or a chain link that then young people danced to to celebrate the goddess. Um, it it was so powerful that in fact, according to Lawler, a dance very like the one described by the ancient sources is still performed in Greece, notably at Megara on Easter Monday. Now I've been to Megara but not on Easter Monday. So I've never seen this dance, but it would be fascinating to see it. And so the, the dance itself remains in the memory of the people of Greece. Yeah. So I found it really interesting that once again, the power of Eletheia is linked to this garland slash snake slash rope um, <laughs> that simultaneously allows people to dance, can be used in childbirth as a physical tool for birth, and also most importantly, uh, can be symbolized or can be associated with the umbilical cord of birth. And so when I found this article, I thought, you know, I, I don't normally pause and talk about one article, especially one that's written in 1948, sometimes those are dated. But uh, I read it and I thought, no, the, the, you know, the research is good. And it, 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 I think it really sums up the um, two things that I've tried to talk about today, which I hope I've done clearly, because again, I apologize. Sometimes the cold medicine messes with me. But the idea that Aletheia is a primordial, and by primordial, I mean, she predates the Greeks, she predates even perhaps the, the Cretans or the Minoans, she predates so-called civilization, okay? Although I would argue that in her primordial form, she's unnamed, but okay. So she is an early powerful goddess of childbirth, fertility, perhaps even a vegetation goddess who is in charge of birthing, of creation and of bringing light. And that that power is associated in some way with snake power, cave wisdom, all of those things that we've talked about before. And secondly, the other thing that I've wanted, hopefully, to talk about today was how that power was usurped by patriarchal Greece from the people, not just from women, but from the people and turned into a masculine representation of what it means to create and what it means to have power, okay? 
So I hope that that's I hope that that's been clear more or less, and I think that that's what makes Alethea fascinating, aside from the fact that she feels like a forgotten sister, a forgotten goddess, because she is so powerful and plays such a key role, even with the Olympians themselves, as we've seen with Athena, with Artemis, with Apollo, etc. So I'm quite happy that we talked about her. I know this episode has been long in the making. I'm, the more I think about her, the more I'm fascinated by fascinated by the cave. And I think, as always, I will notice her name more when I travel to museums and see different representations. Um, and so I hope that you've enjoyed um, this lecture. Uh, I'm going to do an after the podcast. So if you're new uh, and you're just subscribed to my channel, first of all, thank you so much for supporting my work. Um, but after the podcast is a short uh, episode that I post on Patreon after this episode is um, published. And I basically have some some piece of research or some something that I like to talk about that I keep sort of outside of this episode uh, and post especially or only for my Patreon members. And so it's a way for me to find some balance in the sense that I like to give you as much of the research as possible for free on YouTube because that's my whole goal, but it allows me to offer something for my Patreon supporters in thanks for all of my, all of the support that they've given my research and their support helps me do the research and travel and photograph and film and do all these things. So after the podcast, we're going to talk about some really fascinating finds, find, archaeological finds, a few pieces that are found in the most creepiest ways in the ancient Agora in Athens, which is just at the bottom of the Acropolis and the Parthenon uh, Acropolis. And, um, and we're going to look at some of those uh, pieces. But that's okay. If you are not a Patreon supporter and don't want to watch after the podcast, then uh, that's okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I hope that you have enjoyed this episode. And um, I look forward to bringing you the other two uh, goddesses of the Holy Trinity of Crete, which is Dictina and Brito Martis, uh, in the in the coming weeks. And thank you again. Please share. Please like if you're enjoying this. Please tell your friends. Um, this podcast allows me to do the research uh, for my work and the research on Artemis. And I thank you so much for listening and for staying with me uh, throughout the entire episode. And I hope you have a wonderful day and I'll see you next time.